So this is a bit of a challenge talking in this room when there's sort of slide projectors on both sides. So I'm going to tend to stand out here where I can see this one. There's actually a few more seats here. If anybody's worried about not being able to follow, you could always move over there. Um, <coughs> I want to talk to you a little bit about the value of performance recording. I've been asked to talk about the value of performance recording. And as you know, performance recording is the foundation for selection. It's done through breed associations mostly to achieve <laughs> to achieve genetic progress. You must carefully record appropriate phenotypes on cohorts of animals and use them for selection. It's just not good enough just to get data. You have to have good data and you have to use it. Genomics can add real value, but more so in populations with a wide range of phenotypes and more so when you have a sufficient number of animals. So those are the things I'm just going to touch on in my presentation here. So performance recording in New Zealand, we have roughly 35,000 beef cattle across all the breed associations in New Zealand that are performance recorded. Three primary breed associations, the Angus, Hereford and Simmental, represent the bulk of those. At most, that means that 10,000 bulls that are average or better would be produced from those performance recorded herds each year, right? But the annual requirements for bulls in New Zealand are about 10,000 bulls for the national beef herd and another 28,000 for the national dairy herd. Now the numbers depend a little bit about assumptions you make about uh, mating ratios and how long you keep a bull. But what you realise is that the bulk of the bulls that are being used in the New Zealand national herd across beef and dairy are not coming from performance recorded operations. So that's a little bit of a sad indictment of where we are in the, in the current uh, uh, economy where people like information. So most sale bulls are not performance recorded. Those that are, are measured for a bunch of traits. About 95% of them have birth weight, calving ease, and weaning weight. Okay, the numbers are slightly different for each of those, of those three traits. About 75% of them across all the breed associations have a yearling weight. About 40% of them have a final weight record. About 50% of them have an ultrasound measure and about a quarter of them have scrotal circumference and there's really not much else being measured. There's virtually nothing else measured in worthwhile numbers except a few eye pigmentation records and I'm not exactly sure what, what analysis has done to those. Um, but pedigree records like birth date allow calculation of some reproductive traits like days to calving. So it seems to me a much broader scope of records would be beneficial. More information about reproductive performance. I would like to know a lot more about puberty. I'd like to know more about heifer pregnancy rates because those early reproduction traits are important for the animal over the whole lifetime. I'd like to know more about maternal performance not just how good the mother is, but how, good the mo how much the mother eats. So I'd like to know what she weighs and what her condition score was at various times of the year and ages. And I'd like to know about terminal performance, that's carcass and meat quality. Right now, there's virtually no carcass and meat quality data collected around the world in beef breed associations, except in places like Ireland, where they get it on every animal that gets killed in their entire national herd. They all have IDs and half of them are sire identified. The US and, 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 uh, and uh, Canada, there's pretty poor levels of records, I think. And the Hereford Association with six million animals in their pedigree in North America, there's only 3,000 carcass records. So it's not just here, it's a problem in other places. And disease traits is the other area I'd like to see more records being collected. So now I just want to tell you a little bit about performance recording and how it relates to selection. And I chose birth weight and calving ease because that's something you've got a lot of data on, okay? So birth weight, heritability, pretty heritable trait, 0.45. That measures the strength of the relationship between the phenotype that you see and the 
real breeding value the animal has. High heritability means there's a high relationship. Phenotypic standard deviation, a bit over three kilos. So that means most of the animals would fall uh, between plus and minus nine or 10 kilos of the average. So I think Rebecca said the average was 37 kilos. So that would be between say 47 and 27 kilos is where I would expect to see most of them fall. And the genetic part of that is about two kilos. Birth weight is what we would call an indicator trait. It's not something you would want to select for in its own right, but it tells you something about calving ease and it tells you something about later weights. So it's something you would record to help make predictions for selection for other things. Okay. So if I was to graph the true EBV, and it's a bit strange saying true EBV because E stands for estimated, but if I was to show you the true breeding value of animals, there'd be a distribution. And the lighter ones would have a, have a breeding value about seven kilos less than average, and the heavier ones about seven kilos above average. So this, the, the range would be about 15 kilos, smaller than the phenotypic range, because we're just looking at the breeding value here. And if I was to do what's called truncation selection, so I was to sort those animals from heaviest to lightest on their breeding value and take the 40% with, say, the heaviest birth weight, that would be the ones I've shown coloured in there. And if I was to work out the average of all of their breeding values, it would be about plus 2.2 kilos. So 40% selected gives us an intensity of selection of one, so they are about one standard deviation above average. It's about what you would get if you were selecting your heifers, right? You'd keep maybe 40% of the heifers that were born. Okay, so if I select 40% of the animals, a selection intensity of one, I would raise the breeding value for birth weight by 2.2 kilos. If I was to go the other direction, I'd drop it 2.2 kilos. Okay, so calving ease, Heritability about 15%, and we represent this on an underlying scale. So you might only see it's easy carving or it's not, or it's very difficult or moderately difficult or it's easy, but we believe underlying there is a continuous scale, just like birth weight, but you only can drop them into categories because you are not able to discriminate more carefully in the way that you can for, say, birth weight. So if I draw a little plot there, the same kind of thing, and at the top I show difficult carving, and the bottom I show easy carving, and if I was to choose, again, 40% of them, I've drawn a line across there, then those 40% would have, on the underlying scale, they would have be 0.45 units, in this case, above the average, or if I selected for carving ease in the other direction, it would be 0.45 in the other direction. Okay. So we put those two things together because they're both measurements related to each other, birth weight and calving ease. Put them on two axes, so calving ease, calving difficulty on the y-axis up and down and birth weight on the x-axis going left and right. And now I need to tell you about the genetic correlation between those two traits because they're not independent. The genes that are associated with birth weight are associated with calving ease. Not perfectly. The correlation, genetic correlation, is only about uh, 0.4, minus 0.4, which means birth weight tells you something about calving ease, but there's a lot of variation in calving ease that's got nothing to do with birth weight. So if I now draw this ellipse, this ellipse represents, in the, in the, in the cross where the x and y axis is, right in the middle there, the bullseye, that's where your herd is right now, then that outer point of that ellipse is where you could move your herd with one standard deviation of selection. So you could move to any point you like on that ellipse. So it's much easier to go to easy carving and low birth weight than it is to go to easy carving and high birth weight. Okay, so you could move anywhere you like in that ellipse if you could see their true breeding value. Okay, so both the variation and the covariation, the relationship between these traits, 
determines the frontier or potential for moving them together. So the question is, where would you like to go on that graph? And each of you maybe have a different idea about where you would like to go. If you were to only record birth weight or calving ease, or only use one or the other, then you don't have too much choice. But where I would like to move is down there. I'd like the animals to be easy calving, but I'd probably like them to have heavier birth weights. I'd probably like them to have as heavy a birth weight as I possibly could while they still calved early and didn't hurt the calf or the cow, right? And that's a difficult direction to move in. The easy place to move is to make them easy calving and little. Okay. So in practice, we never know the true breeding value, so you don't have the option of doing what I just described. All you can select on is the EBV, which is based on whatever phenotypic records you collected. And those predictions have errors, and the size of the errors depend on the amount of information used. So if you present a bull to me and all you tell me about the bull is it's an Angus or it's a Hereford, and you say, how good is it? I'll tell you straight away, I expect it to be breed average. And it doesn't matter if you show me 100 bulls or 1,000 bulls, I'll always give you the same answer. I'll always say, I expect it to be breed average. And on average, I'll be right. That will be a better answer than anybody else could possibly give. That's the best prediction available. But my prediction has no variation. It's always the same. As I get more information on the bull, I can be a little bit more discriminating, and my variance will grow. And the more and more information, eventually it will grow to be the same as the genetic variance in the whole population. So if we just look, what would it look like if I had a bull, every bull had his own birth weight and his own calving ease score and had information on 50 offspring? So that's quite a lot of information. That's what that inner ellipse would show me. So the inner ellipse shows me how far I could move by selection on those bulls. It's inside the other one because the EBV system is what we call in statistics a shrinkage, a shrinkage estimator. We shrink the data to what we can believe in. And the more information you give me, the less I shrink it. So if you give me bulls with hundreds of offspring, I'll tell you exactly what their EBV is. But if you give me ones with only 50, I have to shrink the information. And if you'll notice, it's not shrunk very much on the left and the right direction because birth weight is quite highly heritable. So 50 offspring tells me a lot of information about the bull. It's shrunk more on the up and down axis because calving ease has a lower heritability, right? So that's why the ellipse is shrunk. So if I was selecting a bull, I can move anywhere based on that particular uh, internal ellipse. If a bull only had his own record, his own birth weight and calving ease, and just one offspring, then it would be that inner ellipse again, okay? So the EBVs we saw, Jason has shown you and Rebecca has shown you, that averaged across herds, yeah, they kind of follow what we'd expect them to follow, but when you start talking about individual animals, young bulls that were only based on a phenotypic record on themselves, the estimates have been shrunk a lot because there's not much valuable phenotypic information on them when you can only measure them themselves. To get reliable information, we need to measure lots of offspring. So if I want to move birth weight and calving ease, I can't move it nearly as well as I would like to when the only information I have is the phenotypic record on the bull itself. Okay, And that's one of the reasons why we're interested in genomics. Okay, so... Um, Let's come back to that sire with 50 offspring and say, how would you do your selection if your selection was amongst a number of bulls that had their own birth weight and calving ease and the same information on 50 of their offspring? So if you do what a lot of American breeders do, they have this real concern about birth weight. Everybody thinks birth weight is what drives calving ease and we should be against birth weight. So if you're against birth weight, you might choose the bulls with the lowest birth weight possible. So if you go all the way around that ellipse, and sorry I point to one in the but I don't know if I've pointed to this one or to that one. 
whichever one I do half of you will be unhappy so I won't point to any of them and that way you can all be unhappy. So if you were to go around the ellipse and say where on the ellipse is the point where the birth weight is lowest, it's the point where that black arrow is pointing to. So if I select against birth weight, what you'll see, I'm making a big reduction in birth weight, but the arrow only points slightly down, so I'm only making a small reduction in calving ease. If, on the other hand, I said, I'm going to ignore the birth weight information, I'm going to send it into the breed association, it's going to be used to calculate the EBVs, but I'm going to do all the selection on the calving ease EBV because that contains all the information from birth weight and calving ease, then I'm going to move into that black arrow. And that black arrow has gone down a lot more, which means I've, I've, I've improved calving ease a lot more than you would have if you'd selected for birth weight. And I've reduced birth weight a lot less. It's not moving nearly as far to the left, right? So, so two of us with the same information, the same phenotypes collected, can move our herds in quite different directions how we do the selection. But you've got to have the phenotypes recorded and then you've got to do the selection on the EBVs in the most appropriate way. Okay, so that's just birth weight and calving ease. If we added, say, weaning weight or yearling weight, it would be hard to be uh, doing a lot of selection for negative birth weight and at the same time for positive weaning weight, just like uh, Rebecca said, there were none of those bulls that had low birth weights in the dairy herd experiment that had high weaning weights. So it's hard to show it in three dimensions. After a generation of selection on progeny tested bulls for calving ease EPV, we are going to reduce difficult carvings. And I've explained this on the underlying scale and that doesn't mean much to you. So to convert it to what it means in difficult carvings, most difficult carvings are in heifers and most of the difficult carvings in heifers are when they carry bull calves. So if I just talk about it in terms of first calf heifers who are producing a bull calf, if you had 20% difficult carvings, you would have reduced it to 12% after a generation of selection on the calving ease EBV. And when you did that, you would have reduced birth weight by one kilo. If you did your selection on birth weight to reduce calving ease, it would take you twice as many years to reduce calving ease from 20% to 12%. It would take you twice as long. And in doing it, you would have reduced birth weight by four kilos rather than one kilo, okay? So how you use these EBVs is pretty important, not just recording the right phenotypes. Okay, now I could do the same kind of thing for carcass and ultrasound traits, but for some strange reason, they keep asking people like myself who have grown up lecturing to give talks and they don't give us 50 minutes, which is how long we need to tell a proper story. <laughs> be kind of like asking a shearer to share half a sheep, it's just not something we do. I can keep going. I've got time. Okay, good on you. I'm, I'm, still go I'm still good. Okay, okay. Well, I haven't got the slides in there to do this because I took them out because it was 30 minutes. But I could show you the same thing for marbling versus intramuscular fat. And so it's common in, in many breed associations to collect carcass data and to collect IMF data and to use both of them to... to generate EBVs and it's much more efficient if we select on calving ease on, uh, on marbling EBV than if we select on ultrasound EBV. Fortunately you guys have only got ultrasound EBVs because you don't have any carcass data which doesn't really make too much sense to me but anyway. I just want to tell you a little bit then since I was asked to talk about the value of performance recording to think about some of these concepts in terms of value. So. On the left, I've got um, an equation in that blue box which was referred to in the 1930s as the breeder's equation, and it tells us how to predict how much response you make. And there are three things that matter in it. One of them is, is determined by that letter I. That's how intense your selection was. And before I said, let's talk about intensities of selection of 40%. If you were to only choose the best 10%, that would be more discriminating, more intense selection, you'd make more progress. The R in there is about the accuracy of the EBVs. 
and the accuracy of the EVVs tell me how much things have been shrunk. So when things are really accurate, they haven't been shrunk much because there's a lot of information. When there's not much information, they get shrunk a lot and the accuracy would be a lot lower. So R is exactly the accuracy that comes out on your breed plan reports. And then there's the, the genetic standard deviation. That tells me how much variation there is. And then on the bottom we've got L, that's the length of the generation interval. That's the age of the parents when the offspring are born. And people often tell me, guys, at a meeting on, on Friday, oh, we want a low generation interval. We want to turn the generations over quicker. And yeah, that's true, you do. But if you're turning the generation interval, if you're keeping the generation interval low, you're turning the generations over quicker. That means you need to choose more of your available replacements. That means you're doing less intense selection. So there's a trade-off between these things. So people often tell me, yeah, we want a real short generation interval, but a real short generation interval means you're not being as discriminating choosing replacements. So you're winning by having a shorter generation interval, but you're losing by having less intense selection. So actually there's kind of a happy medium where it doesn't matter that much as one goes up, the other one goes down, and they tend to trade off each other. Okay, so what is the accuracy of selection? Well, it turns out that's the R I told you that comes out on your breed plan reports. It's a function of information, and I've just shown you there what it is. If it's direct selection using only the individual's own phenotype, it's the square root of the heritability. If it's indirect selection on something else, like selecting on IMF to try and improve carcass, then it depends on the genetic correlation and the heritability. If we're progeny testing, it depends on the number of offspring we have and what the relationships are between the, the progeny we're measuring, whether they're half sibs or full sibs. If we use genomic information, it depends upon the proportion of variation the genomic test explains. And if we combine genomic and some indicator trait, then it's another formula that I'll show you at the bottom there. So now if we just think of a herd that has cows that carve at 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, and 8, um, then we work out the um, cow generation of all the average age of cows when offspring are born, and we take into account the fact that there's a reduction in number of cows at each age group because of progressive culling. Then the normal average age would be about five years. Okay, so the average cow when she calves is about five years when they're calving from about two to eight. If we were to try and uh, do ultrasound analysis or genomic analysis and use bulls as young as we possibly could to take advantage of a quick generation interval, then we would measure the bulls at a year, hope there was enough discrimination between them at their young age. We would, we would use them as size as yearlings and we could rank them when they were two years of age. And if we're going to do progeny testing, we can't do these matings in our own herd because we don't yet know which the good ones are. We need to do it somewhere else. We need to do it on some commercial animals to work out which are the good bulls so we can use them back in our own herd. So the bull would be two years old by the time I've worked out how good he was based on offspring um, he would be two and three when I've also been born in my own herd. The average generation for the bull would be two and a half years. So if I go through those kind of cal uh, calculations and I say the phenotype I was going to use for my selection was the ultrasound measurement on the individual, if I used males only, the annual gain I could get is 0.09 units of marbling score. If I was to do selection on both sexes, so I was to measure my heifers, so I can do selection on the heifer side and the bull side at the same time, then my progress goes up to 0.13. It's not twice what it is if I measure just the bulls, because the intensities of selection are not the same on the bull side and the cow side, even though the accuracy is the same. So what this shows you is that, that effectively what we do when we do selection, is we invest in accuracy. We purchase accuracy. I buy accuracy by buying phenotypes. And the more I spend on buying phenotypes, 
the more accuracy I get and the more gain I get. So it comes to a value proposition. What does it cost to measure an ultrasound phenotype to decide if it's better to measure heifers and bulls or just to measure bulls? But I can buy a faster gain than you if I want to by spending more on the phenotypes. But that may or may not make me more profitable. It all depends on costs and prices. Alternatively, I could use a genomic test. And how good the genomic test is totally depends on how much of the variation the genomic test explains. So I just showed you for using bulls at the same ages, um, if it accounts for 10% of the variance, 20% of the variance, or 50% of the variance, then the rates of gain would be 0 0.06, 0 0.08, or 0 0.13. So what that shows you is an accurate genomic test could be as good as an indicator trait like IMF, could be as good in terms of genetic gain, whether it's as good in terms of cost-benefit depends on what a genomic test costs compared to what an ultrasound test costs. The trouble is getting accurate genomic test requires lots of phenotypes. So it's really not an option to start doing genomic testing on something that you haven't got a lot of historical phenotypes on because you can't come up with a good, accurate genomic test without having first done the, the, done the uh, existing phenotyping. If I was to combine the genotypes and the individual measurement, like the ultrasound measurement, again, the accuracy and the response I get is going to depend on how accurate my genomic test is. And I've shown you there for 10%, 20%, and 50%. And if you compare the, 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 I'm sorry, the little blue brackets on the right have kind of moved in the transmission of these slides from my computer to somebody else's. But at 10%, with genomic test alone, we got a gain of 0.06. At 10% with genomic and ultrasound, we got a gain of 0.11. So having both the phenotype and the genotype makes a big increase in accuracy than just having the genomic test alone, if the genomic test is not very accurate. But if we have a really accurate genomic test, like, say, 50%, with 50% accuracy of the genomic test, adding on the ultrasound phenotype didn't add as much extra value to it. So the value of the phenotype will erode the better and better the test gets. Right? Most of the tests in uh, genomics for cattle are probably less than 50% in beef cattle at the moment. For the dairy cattle, they're a bit more than that. LIC's ones are probably more like 60, 65% now, but they have you know, genotyped 100,000 or more animals and, and uh, have phenotypes on millions of, of offspring. The other option would be the progeny test. And uh, progeny test, young bulls could be used as, as yearlings. The progeny test offspring would be born when the bulls are two. The progeny then would be harvested uh, when they are two, which would make their progeny test size four. The progeny test bulls would then be used as breeding at four and five. Their offspring back in your herd would be born when the born when the bulls are five and six. So your average generation interval on your bulls would be five and a half. Okay, so the generation interval is a lot higher when you progeny test the bulls than it is when you just use the bulls as young animals. So what's the genetic gain from progeny testing? So we have the advantage now, the accuracy is a lot higher. So progeny testing is kind of the gold standard. You can get the accuracy all the way up to one if you want to spend enough money doing it. In the dairy industry, they used to spend something like $25,000 per bull to progeny test a bull. And they got something like 75 to 100 daughters from every one of those bulls. So I've shown you there for 5, 20, or 100 offspring. Now this would be difficult to do in the beef industry because you'd have to have access to a lot of cows to do all of that progeny testing. If you've got to test all of the bulls born in your herd, you need a huge number of commercial cows to do that test on. And the practicalities of doing it, you know, if you look at what Jason's doing at the moment with relatively small numbers of bulls and relatively small numbers of offspring, it's a lot more difficult to do this with hundreds of bulls getting 100 offspring each. But uh, we have a much more accurate selection, so that's a good thing. But the trouble is the generation interval has gone upwards because we're progeny testing. 
And so the net effect is, in this particular case, our gains really aren't much better than they were when we were doing individual selection on the, on the animals themselves. So progeny testing is the gold standard, but it's struggle for it to be competitive if the animals can be measured directly. But if we were talking about some other trait, like um, heifer pregnancy or, or um, longevity of daughters and those kind of things, it may be that progeny testing is much, much better than individual. It just depends. And this is a very simplistic example of a single trait. In real life, we have to take all of the traits that you're interested in and put that together with all their variance components. So conclusions. Gain is driven by the accuracy of EVV at selection age, right? That's what drives gain. If you don't have accurate EVVs at selection age, you can't expect to make much progress. At the same selection age, investing in having more phenotypes can directly influence your gain by increasing accuracy. So buying phenotypes is just buying accuracy, which is just buying gain, provided you're using those phenotypes to give you EVVs that you're selecting on. Progeny can give you any accuracy you want, but increased generation intervals can erode the value of the extra accuracy. And the impact on generation intervals and the impact on gain is trait specific. And it's for that reason that it's very, very popular, say in the dairy industry, but not as popular in, say, the sheep and beef industry. Genomic testing can be competitive to progeny testing, but only if the genomic tests are accurate. And the problem is that accurate genomic tests rely on lots of phenotypes, and accurate genomic tests also rely on lots of genotypes. And when I look at the performance recording circumstances in New Zealand at the moment, I'd say, well, for a start, you're really weak on genotypes. And for a second thing, you're really weak on phenotypes. If you're going to the cost of investing in a genotype, it's better if you've got 20 phenotypes on the animal, not birth weight, calving ease, weaning weight, sometimes yearling weight, occasionally ultrasound, and a bit of scrotal circumference. You really want to have a bigger range of phenotypes. Final word. New Zealand has an opportunity to improve returns from its beef industry by achieving higher rates of gain, but it relies on performance recording more cattle, right? Many bulls are being sold without ever having been recorded, or else they're being home recorded, but the data is never being shared. So somebody's recording those animals and some of their weights, but they're not putting it on any database, it's not contributing to any analysis, to help everybody else's animals get evaluated. This could be achieved by extending the level of performance recording in nature and scope. So some countries have done a much better job in the New Zealand, the New Zealand beef industry about trying to get phenotypes from a broader uh, group of animals. And in Australia, they've invested quite heavily in these beef Im improvement nucleus, beef information nucleuses to try and get more data and to drive uh, to drive their genomic analyses. The benefits from genomics are dictated by its accuracy, and the accuracy is limited by the extent of genotyping. The value of genotyping is increased when prediction can be applied over the full range of economically relevant traits. So one of the decisions the breed associations in New Zealand in general have to make is, is, is this something you want to get into or not? There's no point getting half-heartedly into it. You either get it into it properly or you don't bother. Now, one option is to not bother and just import animals from overseas and multiply them up here. That would be one option for the industry. The other option for the industry is to try and do this properly. And to try and do it properly, we need a better attitude towards phenotypic performance recording. And we need to genotype a significant number of animals. And it's interesting that there's been so much commercial interest in these progeny testing programs, the maternal progeny test and the beef progeny test that BLG have been running, which indicates there are a lot of commercial farms out there who are wanting this information that has not been provided sufficiently by the performance recording going through the breed associations. I've probably gone way over time, have I? Have I done 50 minutes? That's my... Perfect, perfect.
Sorry about that. Have you got any tips on how we go about getting more enthusiasm about collecting these phenotypes and genotypes? Um, you know, I, I think somebody just has to get on and do it and demonstrate it to the rest. It's, otherwise, it's kind of like round, rounding up cats. If you want to round them all up before you move forward, it's never going to happen. So somebody just needs to take the initiative, whether the somebody is one breed association or whether the somebody is two or three breeders or, or a particular, some other kind of alliance, and just get on with it and a bunch of other people will follow quite quickly. I'm hoping that beef and lamb genetics will be one of those somebodies who will do it on the animals for their maternal pro uh, progeny test and their progeny test herds, and do it as an example that anybody else who wants to do it as well, we can add all that data together and start running some prototype analyses combining all of this data. But you just have to get on with it. But it is a significant investment. And say it's not worth starting if there's not enough money. I, I always say that a thousand animals is what needs to be genotyped as a minimum to get to get one of these predictions that's really worth talking about. So it's not worth doing 500. You hold the money in the bank to you ready to do a thousand, do a thousand all at once, and a month later we can get all of the data and start running these analyses. But what level do you think that bell curve will move by doing this? Okay, so the, the, the bell curve, generally speaking, is a biological phenomenon that we don't have too much control of. But whenever we do selection, it just moves. It just moves along, so the, the range doesn't really change. We can't select to change the range, but we can easily select to change the mean. And we can move the mean as far as you like in virtually any direction you like. Now, cattle in the past, the predecessors of modern cattle, the oryx, were really, really big cattle. And domestication of, of dogs and cattle and sheep and everything has tended to make them smaller and smaller. So it's very easy to make them bigger and bigger again. But we can also change lots of other things. We can change puberty, we can change marbling, we can change calving ease, we can change behavior, whatever you want to change. Typically, you want to change lots of things at once. So if you're moving lots of things at once, then you're not moving any one of them huge amounts. But we can move the mean of all of those things without having to worry at all about variation. You would know from your pig backgrounds um, that when I was a young fellow, graduated from university, tw 20 pigs per sow per year was, uh, was the sort of state-of-the-art reproductive performance. And if I had t told anybody then that today we'd be talking about 30 or 35 pigs per sow per year as being a, a commercial reality in a high-performing herd, nobody would have believed me, right? So there's amazing opportunities to improve performance by selection, just moving that mean in a little bit at a time each year. Are the results going to be transferable to build a training population? Yeah, so, um, you know, there are various companies that genotype individuals, and uh, it doesn't make much difference what company you use to do the genotyping, right? The genotypes are all pretty high quality, but the genomic analysis itself, the state-of-the-art way of doing it now, what we call a single step, we combine the pedigree information, the performance recording, and the genotypes all in the same analysis together. Um, what happened when genomic tests first became available, two animal health companies looked at the space and said, farmers are never going to be able to afford to do this stuff. So they said, if we go and do the genotyping, we could have a proprietary test which we could sell back to the farmers and that's fair enough, to recoup the investment they did in that initial discovery phase. And I was involved in several experiments that Pfizer did and some that, that, that um, Igenity did, where they invested several million dollars in each experiment they did with us to come up with a prediction. And in all cases, at that time, they thought if they did it in one population, it would work all around the world. 
and they use the example of ivermectin. Ivermectin is, a, is, a, is an anthelmetic that works all over the place. You know, it works in humans and chickens and pigs and sheep, and they, they thought the genomic test would be an information thing they could sell that was equivalent to an ivermectin test. So they did all this investment in Angus, and they expected it would work in everything. And unfortunately for them, they discovered that it didn't actually work in shorthorns, and it didn't work in Herefords, and it didn't work in Simmental if the only data they had was Angus. But they weren't prepared to repeat that investment process in every one of the other breeds. So the problem is if a company is doing it and they choose not to share their genotypes, you could have the situation where, say, two companies or two organisations each have half of the genotypes. If you could put them together, you would have a much more powerful prediction, right? So, so it really doesn't matter who does it as long as whoever's do doing it has all of the genotypes and has all of the phenotypes. And right now, a lot of the genotypes are kind of in the public domain. They're owned by breed associations, say. And to me, it's far more sensible that those are open than that all of the data analysis and so on is done by, a, by an animal health company who might keep the results secret. So I think everybody wins if we could do it collectively on the same database, put all the data in, put all the genotypes in. Somebody does need to go around selling the tests and running the genotyping labs, and if that's, say, an animal health company, I don't have any problem with that, if that's how the, how the market wants it to happen. But in terms of the data analysis, we want all the relevant data together in the same analysis. Yeah, thanks, Dorian. Um, I'm interested in the training population. Uh, where New Zealand has less resources to develop its own training um, population, uh, where is the scope to share um, resources with Australia, both from an Australian point of view, we want a bigger training population, and New Zealand um, to sort of piggyback on each other. I agree that the phenotypes need to right. be with the genotype, but... Yep. Okay, so um, generally speaking, we believe that if we, if we had genotypes on the actual causal variants that are making the differences in, in performance, then those tests would work anywhere. They'd, they'd work in any breed and probably in any country and so on. They might even work across humans and dogs and cattle. We know a lot of the same genes are involved in things like hide. But right now, the genotypes that we're using are not the causal genes. We don't even know what most of the causal genes are. They are just markers that track the inheritance of fra fragments of, of chromosomes. And what we know about that kind of prediction is it works best in close relatives of the training population. So if you can train on parents and grandparents, you'll have much better prediction on offspring than you will on grand offspring or cousins or more distant relatives. So that means you really want the the, the training population to include individuals that are very, very close to the ones you're targeting as selection candidates. So if I was wearing a New Zealand hat, I would say that means we want New Zealand animals in the population. Now, we can add animals from whatever other country makes sense, depending on who is closely linked to those. And I have done some analyses with PVB and with the breed associations to look at influential sires in each of those breed associations and see where did those sires come from. Did they come from one breeder? Did they come from a number of breeders? What country did they come from? And the answer is actually different for the different breed associations. So there are some breed associations who collaborating with Australia would make a lot of sense. There are some other breed associations where collaborating with the US would make a lot more sense than collaborating with Australia because their influential sires are sires that were influential in the US. So the chromosome fragments will be shared between New Zealand and the US, right? Now, I didn't have the Australian data, pedigree data, so it may be the Australian data actually shares the same US ancestors, so it may be that putting the three of them together would be the best thing to do. But there are other breed associations that don't seem to share any connections with 
influential sires in either Australia or the US, that means they pretty well have to do their own thing. So you really have to look at the data and say, where are the close relatives? In the chicken and pig breeding industry, where there are a number of different lines, you find you can't predict one line from training in the other line, right? You have to do each of these lines on their own. And in pigs and chickens, they don't have to have been separate for very many years before you don't get uh, much predictability across the lines. Each year, each generation you go down, the predictability declines quite a bit with our current technology. We hope as we get closer to major genes that, that the predictability will stand up you know, across multiple generations much more than it does at the moment. In the dairy industry, this was very easy to do because most of the world uses the same influential Holstein uh, sire lines. So virtually every country other than New Zealand and uh, Ireland and maybe Australia, every other country could benefit from putting their data together. And that's what most countries did. They exchanged data with each other. So now there's kind of two big conglomerates who put all of their data together for a, for a combined analysis. And each partner benefits from getting a lot more data because they get it from the other partners as well. So everybody is better off.